as I mentioned earlier, there are so many seasons of life, things we go through, where we really do feel overwhelmed. Uh, What I might describe as the giants of life. Uh, I shared with you recently that I have uh, started a relationship with Kevin uh, Vicknair, who uh, lost his wife in a uh, senseless shooting at the Round Rock Juneteenth event two months ago. And been working with the Round Rock churches that we're connected with to uh, raise some funds to start 529 accounts for his three young kids to try to help them uh, cover some of their future college expenses. Uh, Kevin even attended church here at City View a few weeks ago and uh, was here with us, got a chance to pray with him after service. Uh, Keep Kevin and those children in your prayers. Of course, it's been such a difficult time. Uh, My point is to say, like, that's not what Kevin thought his journey was going to look like, right? Um, Something that just really came out of nowhere and has impacted him deeply. And so I've invited him even to participate in our grief share ministry this fall, a community of people who are processing loss and grief together and finding hope in Christ. In our church family, we're walking through this experience of death and loss with many others. Uh, We're still grieving collectively the death of Eric Sidham this summer from from cancer, putting our arms of love and care around uh, Stephanie and their daughter, uh, Kira. Uh, Barry and I were talking last week after after, uh, service to Cindy Ponder, uh, one of our amazing City View women who's learning how to navigate uh, life without her husband, Don, who's passed away in the last year. And Cindy was sharing with us that even in the midst of her grief and what she's walked through, that God's allowed her to minister to other widows. And there's a group now that has been uh, gathered to help support each other. That's now 22 women uh, connected in this widow support group. Why am I sharing this stuff with you this morning? Just to remind you that we all face giants in our lives. Whether it is the giant of loss and loneliness, the giant of unemployment and rejection, uh, or the giant of receiving a cancer diagnosis from a doctor. Even in our own family, two weeks ago I was uh, up here celebrating our son's 18th birthday. Yeah. And then last Sunday we were in the ER with him and received a diagnosis of a word we didn't even know, we had to look up, uh, rhabdomyolysis. That kept him at Seton Hospital for five nights uh, for treatment. That was not on our bingo card uh, for last week. The truth is that we live in a broken, fallen world that has been corrupted by sin and corrupted by death. And it's not just loss. It's the giant of addiction that can overwhelm us as well. So here's the point. The point is, even when we are following Christ closely, walking with God intimately, listen to me, we will face unexpected and difficult trials. We will face unexpected and difficult trials. I've been reading in my devotional life this last week, the book of Job. And Job is a book all about this question. It's one of the oldest books in the Bible, and it's all about how do you navigate loss, pain, and suffering with faith and hope in God. Job reminds us that not only do we face the giants of sin in us and suffering in the world, we also face a real spiritual enemy who's not as powerful as God, but is powerful and working to destroy us. So the question is, is how will we face and navigate these giants in our lives? Today, I'm excited we're continuing our study of the life of David. I hope that you really learned a lot last week as we looked about God's unexpected choice of this shepherd boy to be king. But today, we read one of the most famous stories in all of scripture, David's battle with Goliath. I wanna remind you here that familiarity with Bible stories can cause us to miss important truths and details. So as we read this story, and I preach it over you this morning, I want to encourage you to look to listen and to learn with fresh insight today. How can we face the giants in our lives like David with courageous faith and not like Saul with fear and passivity? 
I honestly want to say over you before we read the text, I actually think to say that this chapter is about David v. Goliath is to miss really the point of the chapter. The, the author is not contrasting David and Goliath. The author is contrasting David and Saul. David and Saul. And as we read the text, I want you to listen to how the two of these men respond to the same giant. Now, I have to warn you before we read today's passage, it's long. 1 Samuel 17 has 58 verses in it. <laughs> but it's one story. And I was like, how do I break this up? How do I read a half of it? You know, And I was just like, I can't do it. So I have to read the whole thing over you this morning. So I just want you to like get some water. Stretch, like if you need to stretch, you know, it's like, you know, Moses had like Aaron, you know, like holding up his arms, you know, if you need somebody to hold you up while we're doing the, the reading, do that. But uh, we want to pace ourselves, but we have to read this whole story. It's one of the most powerful stories in all of the Bible. So, are y'all ready? Okay, let's stand together. I'll read fast. So make sure you're paying attention. 1 Samuel 17, God's word to us today. The Philistines gathered their forces for war at Saka in Judah and camped between Saka and Azekah and Ephes Damim. Saul and the men of Israel gathered and camped in the valley of Elah. Then they lined up in battle formation to face the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on one hill and the Israelites were standing on another hill with a ravine between them. Then a champion named Goliath from Gath came out from the Philistine camp. He was nine feet, nine inches tall and wore a bronze helmet and bronze scale armor that weighed 125 pounds. There was a bronze armor on his shins and a bronze javelin was slung between his shoulders. His spear shaft was like a weaver's beam and the iron point of his spear weighed 15 pounds. In addition, a shield bearer was walking in front of him. He stood and shouted to the Israelite battle formations, Why do you come out to line up in battle formation? He asked them, Am I not a Philistine and you are not servants of Saul? Choose one of your men and have him come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. When Saul and all Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost their courage and were terrified. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite from Bethlehem of Judah named Jesse. Jesse had eight sons and during Saul's reign was already an old man. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war and their names were Eliab the firstborn, Abinadab the next, and Shammah the third. And David was the youngest. The three oldest had followed Saul, but David kept going back and forth from Saul the tent to his father's flock in Bethlehem. Every morning and evening, for 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand. One day, Jesse told his son David, take this half bushel of roasted grain along with these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to the camp. Also take these 10 portions of cheese to the field commander. Check on the well-being of your brothers and bring a confirmation from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Eli fighting with the Philistines. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with someone to keep it, loaded up and set out as Jesse had charged him. He arrived at the perimeter of the camp as the army was marching out in its battle formation, shouting their battle cry. Israel and the Philistines lined up in battle formation, facing each other. David left his supplies in the care of the quartermaster and ran to the battle line. When he arrived, he asked his brothers how they were. While he was speaking with them, suddenly the champion named Goliath, the Philistine from Gath, came forward from the Philistine battle line and shouted his usual words, which David heard. When all the Israelite men saw Goliath, they retreated from him, terrified. Previously, an Israelite man had declared, do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the family of that man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The troops told him about the offer, concluding, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. 
David's oldest brother Eliab listened as he spoke to the men and he became angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked. Who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. What have I done now, protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him to others in front of him and asked about the offer and the people gave him the same answer as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul so that he had David brought to him. David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. But Saul replied, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth and he's been a warrior since he was young. David answered Saul, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it, struck it down, and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed lions and bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul had his military clothes put on David. He put a bronze helmet on David's head and had him put on armor. David strapped his sword on over the military clothes and tried to walk, but he was not used to them. I can't walk in these, David said to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off. Instead, he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in the pouch in his shepherd's bag. Then with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistines came closer and closer to David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he despised him because he was, young, he was just a youth, healthy and handsome. He said to David, am I a dog that you come out against me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beast. And David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword spear, and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. When the Philistine started forward to attack him, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, and hit the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down to the ground. David defeated the Philistine with a sling and a stone. David overpowered the Philistine and killed him without having a sword. David ran and stood over him. He grabbed the Philistine's sword, pulled it from its sheath, and used it to kill him. Then he cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah rallied, shouting their battle cry, and chased the Philistines to the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Philistine bodies were strewn all along the Sha'arim road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from the pursuit of the Philistines, they plundered their camps. David took Goliath's head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put Goliath's weapons in his own tent. When Saul had seen David going out to confront the Philistine, he asked Abner, the commander of the army, whose son is this, Abner? Your majesty, as surely as you live, I don't know, Abner replied. The king said, find out whose son this young man is. When David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him, brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem, David answered. This is the word of the Lord. Amen, amen. You can be seated. You made it. Woo! I feel like we should just pray and have the invitation. I don't know that I can add a whole lot to that. Isn't that good? Gosh, I love that story. All right, I wanna help you see in the text. Um, I wanna help you understand about Israel's enemy. So we're gonna look at Goliath first. Uh, we're gonna look at David's faith, we're gonna look at God's victory. Very important, God's victory, not David's victory, God's victory. And then we're gonna look how all that connects to us. So let's start by learning about Israel's enemy, Goliath. This is the first 11 verses. Gives us some important details about the champion of the Philistines, 
Goliath. He's portrayed using a few phrases. Let me give them to you. First of all, he's a giant fighter. He's a huge man. The CSB says here in the English, our English translation that he was nine feet, nine inches tall, which is the English translation of a Hebrew phrase, six cubits and a span. Now, that's the Hebrew of the majority text. That's the most common Hebrew translation, Hebrew version. But there are two additional versions that have a different number. The LXX, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are very ancient Hebrew scrolls that were found in the desert by the Dead Sea. They both say four cubits and a span, which is six feet, nine inches tall. So was Goliath almost 10 feet tall or almost seven feet tall? Honestly, it's irrelevant to me because the main point here is that he was an enormous human being, (laughs) okay? He was much larger, much stronger, much taller than any of the Israelites. The average Israelite at that time in history would have been about five feet, six inches tall. So compared to this, Goliath was huge. Second of all, he had strong armor. The text describes massive, heavy armor and weapons, Goliath had all of this heavy armor and he had a shield bearer whose whole job was just to walk in front of him and carry his shield. Third, he was a bold intimidator. We read that he taunted the Israelites and their king Saul. He shouted threats at them. He hurled curses at them. He insulted their God. And finally, we read that he was a representative warrior. Write this phrase down. It's going to be very important later in the sermon. Goliath invites Israel to choose one man to come out and to fight against him. He says, I will represent all the Philistine army. With the whole Philistine army behind him, he's, I'm going to represent them. You pick one fighter who will represent all of Israel and have that fighter come out and fight me. And if I win, we win. If he wins, y'all win. And so the one fighter will represent all the people and whoever wins that representative battle will win a victory for their whole nation. The warrior fights on behalf of his people. Now, when we read this in the story, we would expect at this moment to see King Saul go out and fight Goliath. Why? Because we learned already in 1 Samuel he was the greatest warrior among the Israelites. He was the most accomplished, he was the largest, he was the strongest. But the text says something interesting, that Saul stays back when he should have gone forward. Think about that for a second. He stayed back when he should have gone forward. And so here the text wants us to understand Saul's fear. Verse 11 is very important. It says, after the Philistine made his threat... It calls out Saul by name in verse 11. It says, Saul and all Israel. Why doesn't it just say all Israel? It wants us to hear that Saul and the Israelites were afraid. Here's what I want you to remember this morning. Fear is contagious. We read here that the king should have gone forward and should have fought against Goliath. But instead, he's afraid. What happens when the king is afraid? All the people are afraid. Go down to verse 24 that says this. All the Israelite men saw Goliath and they retreated from him terrified. Fear starts with Saul, who should have gone into battle but doesn't. And it spreads from man to man, from group to group, from Saul to all the people. Think about how you feel when you see somebody afraid. Something in your gut says, should I be afraid? I'm not even sure what they're afraid of, but maybe I should be afraid. Fear begins to spread. This is why you must keep your eyes on Jesus, not the people around you, because fear is contagious. Sometimes we think wrongly, well, I don't want to go out and fight this giant, but maybe if I ignore this giant, this giant will just go away. If I just act like this giant's not here, I just stick my head in the sand and I don't do anything and I don't say anything, it'll go away. But passivity never solves a problem. Write that down. Passivity never solves a problem. Saul learns that even when he is passive and stays in the rear, he learns that giants just keep coming. Giants keep coming. 
Verse 16 says, every morning and every evening for 40 days, this giant, Goliath, comes forward and takes his stand. Now, you might think if you ignore the problem, it will go away, but that's not how it works. God allows us, my conviction, allows us to experience giants in our lives to teach us something to teach us to trust him, to teach us to walk by faith, to teach us to have courage and confidence in God. And that doesn't mean we just stick our head in the sand and say, I hope it goes away. God doesn't bring a giant into your life to teach you passivity. Come on, church. He brings the giant into your life to teach you how to have faith. And this is what we see about David. David has great faith. His faith is displayed five ways in the text. Real quick, first of all, did you notice? He has confidence in the living God. I love his statement in verse 29. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? No, that's not what he says. Who should defy the armies of the living God? Right? Did you see it in the text? This is the first time that phrase shows up in this chapter that David doesn't just say God, he says the living God. Why does he say that? Because when David sees the size of Goliath, he also sees the size of God. I love that phrase, living God, because I want to remind each of you that God is not dead. God is not asleep. God is not gone. He is alive, and he is well, and he is working, and he is reigning, and he is sovereign, and God is, he's got it. Faith requires us to have confidence that God is on the throne right now. Second, David's faith is evident in how he remembers God's past deliverance. Don't you love how David says, you think this Goliath is something? You should have seen me out in the, with the sheep when the, the bear and the lion showed up. See, David knew that he had had these moments with God where he had been serving faithfully in obscurity. Remember last week's sermon? I said, you want to be faithful when nobody's watching so that you can be faithful when everybody's watching. So he's faithful out in obscurity. He's walking with God, just him and the sheep and the Lord, and these enemies, these uh, animals are coming to try to kill the sheep. And what does David do in those moments? He relies on God. Now listen to me very carefully. Relying on God in one battle is what prepares you to rely on God in the next battle. And that's what David is saying here. He's saying to Saul, I have seen God's power in the past. I have seen God show up and deliver me in moments where I should have died. But when God showed up in the past, it's given me confidence in God in the present. And it's so important that we remind ourselves and we tell those stories of God's faithfulness. I love when Michael reminds us in worship, God has a track record. And you have to remind yourself of his track record. You have to tell yourself about his track record. I read this quote by Charles Swindoll this week. I loved it. It said this. He says, so often when facing our own giants, We forget what we ought to remember, and we remember what we ought to forget. He says, we remember our defeats, and we forget our victories. He says, most of us can recite the failures of our lives in vivid detail, but we are hard-pressed to name the specific, remarkable victories God has pulled off in our past. Isn't that true? Man, that just resonated with me as true in my own life that I struggle to remember all the ways God has shown up. David's faith shows up that he remembers. Third, his faith we see in the fact that he's able to overcome accusation and curses. Don't you love in the story that it's not just Goliath who is cursing him and telling him that he's gonna fall, that he's not gonna succeed? It's also who? His brothers? Last week, we talked about his dad forgetting about him. Now his brothers are saying, what the heck are you doing here? Why are you here? You arrogant this and you're evil and your heart's in the wrong place. His own brothers don't believe in him. And then he goes to the king, to Saul, and says, hey, you don't wanna go out there. I got it, let me go out there. And Saul says what? You're too young to do this. Listen, I wanna say this over you. If you're gonna try to do something significant for God, If you're gonna trust him and have faith to step out and do something, you will face accusation, you will face criticism. Listen to me, church. You are not just gonna have to navigate the enemy, you're gonna have to navigate friends who will say you can't defeat that enemy. 
Church, listen to me this morning. I'm talking to somebody in here that you are not just fearful of the enemy, you are fearful of the friends who accuse you of things before you go face the enemy. And I wanna say to you, you gotta listen to David who says, I'm not gonna listen to those accusations. I'm not gonna listen to that criticism. I'm not gonna listen to that cursing because I know my God. Fourth, David is secure in his strengths. Did you love that Saul tries to put his armor on David? (laughs) What is up with Saul? What's up with Saul? Like, I'm not going out there, but if you want my armor, here's my armor. David tries to put it on, doesn't fit, he can't walk in it. David says, you know what? Just give me my staff, give me my sling. This is what I'm used to using and I know God has been faithful to me with these simple things in my life. Finally, we see David's faith in the way he relies on God's power. Verse 45, he says, you come against me, Goliath, in sword and spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies. What does David say in verse 46? The Lord will hand you over to me. David is courageous in faith, but his faith is not in himself. His faith is in God. There's a very important phrase at the end of David's statement. He says in verse 47, the battle is the Lord's. I wanna speak this over you, it's very, very important because some of you have stepped out in courageous faith to do something. God has given you victory, but you have confused God's victory with your victory. Let me say it again. Some of you have stepped out in faith, God has given you victory, and you have confused his victory with your victory. David's not making that mistake. What's he saying? The battle is the Lord's. I don't come against you with my strength and my ability. I come against you in the name of the Lord. David's very clear. If I experience victory in this battle, it's gonna be God's victory. And I want you to hear that this is all about God's victory. If the battle is the Lord's, the victory is the Lord's. If the battle is the Lord's, the victory is the Lord's. This story is not about David's victory. This story is about God's victory. You think David was stronger than Goliath? No, God was stronger than Goliath. The difference between David and Saul was the difference of their vision of God, of how big God was, of how powerful God was. And so David understands, if I go out there and get the victory, it's God who wins the victory and God who gets the glory. God is victorious, of course, over Goliath. The text is so clear in giving us these details that it's God who beat Goliath. Look at the author keeps saying over and over again, he doesn't even have a sword. One stone. It's like, okay, we know. And then the author's like, did you, did you know he just had a sling and a stone? He just keeps telling us these details over and over again to tell us how ridiculous this is that David won this battle, to remind us that it's God who won the victory. Why is that so important? Because it's important that God also overcomes all the doubts. You see, the last chapter was God declaring over David, this shepherd boy out in the field that nobody thought could do anything but watch the sheep, this is the one God says is gonna be king. His dad, his brothers, they all doubt it. He gets into this story with Goliath. Nobody believes he can do this. Saul doesn't believe, Goliath doesn't believe what's going on, everybody's doubting. And here's what you need to understand, that when God shows up victorious, he silences the voice of the doubter. God is victorious over all that doubt. Because the story of this whole book is, can this shepherd boy really be king? If God is on your side, anything is possible. Number three, we see his victory over fear. I want to just mention at the end here in verse 52 that whenever Goliath falls, the text says the men of Israel and Judah rallied. Now, wait a minute. We just read back in the earlier part of this chapter that they were all terrified and running away. And now we read here that they're all rallying and they're shouting their battle cry. Here's what I want you to remember. In the same way that fear is contagious, courage is contagious. And so they see David go out. They see David win the victory by God's power. And now their faith is strong. Now, how does this story connect with our lives today? 
few things and I'm done. First, we all face intimidating giants. All of us. As I mentioned to you before, we all have something in front of us that feels like Goliath. Every one of you in this room, every one of us is facing some challenge, some difficulty, some obstacle that feels too big for us to move, too strong for us to have victory over. Let me mention three that we all face on a daily basis. One is the giant of sin. We face the giant of sin. The corruption in us. Remember Mark was saying earlier, we want to be free of sin, but we struggle with sin. We struggle with sin all around us. Why is this world so full of evil and darkness and brokenness? And we battle that giant. Sin and evil are overwhelming. Why is the world so broken? Why do these terrible things happen to people? It doesn't seem to make sense. Why can't I change? We face the giant of suffering. Like Job, we walk around in the pain of loss and death. We feel the injustice of this world deep in our bones, and we want things to change. We want to know, why can't things be different? We struggle with the giant of Satan, the giant of spiritual attack. We have a real spiritual enemy who's out to get us, who wants to destroy us and our church and our families and our health and our community. We have a real spiritual enemy. Now, he's not omnipotent. God is all powerful, but Satan is also a powerful enemy, and he wars against our souls. We face real intimidating giants. But in the midst of that, David shows us a different way. David inspires us to live with courageous faith, right? David says, even though you're facing a giant enemy, even though you're facing something that feels overwhelming and you don't know how to respond, He is saying to us, he is inspiring us that we need to remember that God is faithful. The living God of 1 Samuel 17 is still the living God today. The living God of 1 Samuel 17 is still the living God today. And when our eyes are on the giants, we forget the power and the faithfulness of God. Now I know your giant right now may feel so big. The thing you're facing may feel so overwhelming, but I want you to hear David say to you, God is bigger God is stronger. And if your God has been faithful in the past, if God has been victorious in the past, he will be faithful in the future. And because of who God is, we can trust him. David reminds us we can trust God. When I say courageous faith, put the weight on the word faith. Courageous faith. It's faith and trust in God, that God is able. We can trust him. So we're connected to the story because we face significant giants. And we're connected to this story because David inspires us toward courageous faith. But I want to finish by showing you the greatest connection we have with the story, and that is through Jesus. Put your pen down. Jesus is the one who wins our ultimate battle for us. You see, it's very tempting to read this story, to hear me read it, to hear me preach it, and to read all of it and think you're David, for me to think I'm David. Oh, I'm the one who goes out and fights Goliath. If I just trust God, I'll have the victory over Goliath. But here's what I want to say to you. Most of the time, we're not David. If we're honest, most of the time, we're the Israelite army. Most of the time, we're the army looking across the valley of Elah at the Philistines and Goliath coming to threaten us and intimidate us. And most of the time when we're there with all of the army of the Israelites standing on the sides realizing we can't win the victory, we're asking ourselves this question. Is there anyone who will go fight for us? The Bible says that Jesus is the son of David, that Jesus is the ultimate David, that he is the king that David foreshadowed. And in our lives, with these intimidating giants in our lives, I want you to remember that you have a king who has gone into the battle for you. I want you to remember that when you face this, the giant of sin, that you have a warrior king who went and hung on a cross and said, I will take all of your sin on my body and die in your place. Because what did Jesus know? Jesus knew that none of us in this room could go out and defeat sin. 
We were not strong enough to defeat that giant. And so Jesus says, I will go. What about the suffering and the injustice and the giant of loss and grief in this life? You strong enough to overcome that? You strong enough in your own strength to battle that, to conquer death and defeat? No, Jesus says, I'll go in that battle for you. Jesus not just goes on the cross and takes on your sin, but he goes in the grave. He goes in there and he dies for you. And then on the third day, he walks out of that grave victorious over death. Thank God we have a king who goes into the battle for us and conquers the giant of death for us. You see, one day the Bible says Jesus is coming back. He's coming back and he will reign on this earth and he will conquer Satan and sin and death once and for all, forever and ever. And on that day, on that day, he will make all things right. On that day, he will make everything sad come untrue. On that day, he will establish his kingdom and Satan will be destroyed and sin will be gone. Friends, listen, you're not David. Jesus is David. Jesus is the one who walks out in courageous faith and fathers follow the Father's will to go to the cross and go to the grave and come out of the grave victorious over every enemy who you will ever face. Now here's the question for you. If Jesus, listen to me, if Jesus has defeated those giants in your life, what are you afraid of? If Jesus has defeated the enemies that will conquer your soul and destroy your life, if Jesus went into battle for you and defeated your greatest enemies, what do you have to fear? Nothing. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that you have gone into the battle for us. We thank you, Jesus, for your victory over our sin, our shame, our suffering, and even over our greatest enemy, Satan. Jesus, you are the conquering king, and today we put our hope and our trust and our faith in you. If you're here this morning and you have not yet put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he is the conquering king. He is the victor. And he invites you to trust in him. And so this morning, I want you to pray with me right now. If you have not prayed to receive Christ as your savior, would you pray with me right now and say, God, I need you. I confess my sin to you. I cannot overcome sin on my own but I believe Jesus conquered sin for me. I believe that he died on the cross for my sin and that he rose from the dead. And today I turn from my sin and put my faith in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me, for saving me, and for making me new. Friends, if you prayed that with me this morning, we believe that God heard your prayer, forgave your sin, and made you new. And we want to say welcome to the family of God. There is no greater joy than to walk with Jesus day by day. For all of those of you here who believe in Jesus and trust in him, I want to pray over you because you have nothing to fear. God, thank you that there is no enemy that we should fear because, Jesus, you have conquered every enemy. And so, God, I pray courageous faith over this church family today. Build our faith in you, Lord, that you have overcome every enemy and that you will guide us to the very end. Lord, would you speak now, Holy Spirit, to this church family. If there are any ways in which they need to exercise courageous faith today. In Jesus' name, amen.